again and welcome to Forum for a Better Understanding, having again a second episode on our program on healthcare reform. It's only once in a while that we have a topic that is so important that we keep the guests and have them kind of say a few different things, go into a different aspect of the topic. Well, we enjoyed last week's program on healthcare reform very much, but we left off a lot of what we needed to cover. In fact, even after today, we may not finish, so we will be having more programs with some of the very guests who were on last week. Be that as it may, I do want to invite you to a website that you could be visiting anytime soon, and it would be a great idea to go see what the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops have for us on this topic. So go to www.usccb.org slash healthcare. It's a brand new segment that they've created for their website in which they are giving us every day important Catholic insights into this issue. We think that you'll find there information that corroborates things we're going to share today. Of course, the bishops are not going to endorse a single policy, but what they are going to do is raise those principles of Catholic social teaching that are so important. <laughs> I also want to remind you that Bishop has been giving his uh, pastoral message on health care, and we are thinking that what we're sharing today will only um, support and encourage you to follow the Bishop's lead on this one. We have three guests again. Carol Bean is the senior organizer for the Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. She helped make this program happen, and we're so glad she came all the way from San Jose to be here. To her side is Paul Werfelman, a Lutheran pastor, formerly at Hope Lutheran Church, and is here all the way from a golf course to be coming to share, after having had a busy morning, some real insight into the issue of why it is that health care reform is so important for him and for all the people that he knows. This is something that touches all of us, even those in Sacramento, because we have a guest today. Ernie Powell, who is the Senior Manager of, for Advocacy for the AARP in their main office up in Sacramento. And we're so glad that Ernie set aside the time and the commitment to visit us all the way down to talk to us from his own work at the American Association for Retired Persons, how important that is, their work on this topic, since it impacts them immensely which means it impacts me immensely, which means all of us are impacted. There's no one that is outside of the purview of healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, where do we want to start right now? I think we have to look at that second principle, and what would that be? Something like, we need to be telling the truth. Why are we not telling the truth, and what does it mean to start telling the truth, Carol? Well, most of us have been hearing the noise uh, on the t on the television in the newspapers and the experts um, but as people of faith I think Paul and I would both agree who speaks for the vulnerable who speaks for the outsider who speaks for the needy because lives are at stake and the myriad of of images that we get rarely address those issues and I want to say something about the history of um, three aspects in, in our di debate that create a problem of truthfulness. And one is politics, and the other is the press, and the third are prophets. And so we have seen since Truman, since Truman in the 1940s, when he introduced a national health insurance plan, the AMA spent $200 million, that's f from our, our pricing, um, to defeat it. And doctors were actually accused of violating their ethics because they were convincing people to vote against it or to voice their, uh, their uh, convincing their patients. And then in the 70s, Nixon tried to pass a health insurance reform, which is actually very similar to what the Democrats are trying to pass now. And, um, the Democrats, the, the progressive Democrats and the, and the union said, let's hold it off and let's pass it in midterm when we can take credit. And then, of course, we all know the Harry and Louise ads from uh, um, President Clinton's time. And even Newt Gingrich admitted that uh, we would never get a Democrat out of office if health care was passed. So historically, 
those who are not in power don't want the other side to solve the problem and get the credit. And I think we're seeing some of that in the debate. It's also profits. We've got a $2.7 trillion industry. And the health insurance companies have a vested interest. Uh, the doctors have a vested interest and in people who are making money. Uh, th the health insurance industry, amazingly, is spending $1.4 million a day, a day on advertising and lobbying. It's, uh, it's uh, amazing. And then I think, uh, Paul, you've, you were talking about the images on, on uh, television and what the press has been doing and, and how that is muddying the waters. Well, of course, it's muddying the waters, and there are there are a lot of myths out there about about who's spending what and who's going to cover uh, the cost of, of this and that. Um, it seems that uh, when 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 things and institutions move uh, from somewhere else to the United States, somehow in the United States they become an enterprise uh, rather than necessarily a social, um, uh, civil kind of. Uh, fostering community kind of thing. Uh, we see who can make how much out of, out of any industry, uh, including um, churches. They we're, we're not exempt. Ernie, you're here especially in your capacity doing the work at the AARP. Before I ask you about the myths and have everybody opt in on what are the myths, why don't you let everybody know why it is that you are so committed to health care reform in your own work with the AARP? The reason that AARP is so strongly committed to health care reform is, number one, our main goal in this is to, is to protect Medicare. And what we're seeing right now is some very good things in the legislation. We haven't endorsed any of the bills yet, but we've seen some very good possibilities in the legislation. People that are on Medicare, even though they have the program, spend 30% of their income uh, out of pocket on health care. There's the giant do donut hole, which is the benefit gap within the Part D drug benefit. And of course, most of the drafts we've seen so far either closes it right away or closes that donut hole in, in time. Um, a huge amount of money is spent on people who are readmitted to hospitals after surgery. And there is, there are, there again is legislation there that will do better planning for, pe for people as they leave hospitals. But the bottom line for ARP is to to work with our members and to, um, and to do what we can to, to, to protect Medicare. The second issue that's important to ARP, and again it impacts our members, is for the 50 to 64 year old ARP member. 7.1 million people in that age category don't have health insurance. They don't have health insurance, and a million of them are in California. They don't have health insurance because of pre-existing conditions, because of the economy, they may have lost their jobs, uh, for a whole myriad of reasons. Again, we're seeing, and we want to see solutions in this. So, we, uh, our, our members care intensely about this issue. Uh, we're looking for a, we, we've seen, we're looking for a good bipartisan debate, and we're very much involved in it. And the bottom line for us is to make sure that the successes of Medicare, which have been carried out since 1965, which have done done such great things for people to give them dignity in their retirement e years. Um, we want to make sure that those successes are protected and then uh, uh, make sure that people that lack the coverage uh, get the coverage and that costs are brought down. Let's look at those seven myths, at least seven that I think we've diagnosed, and if there's more, we'll talk about them. The first one might be that this is marking absolutely a government takeover of all health care, that it is definitely um, a takeover, that it's not something that's being done well, but it's completely usurping something else. What do you want to, how would you like to clarify what's really meaning to be in this healthcare reform? Well, I was surprised when I was uh, delving into this because the noise on, on the TV never gave me clarity about what, what people were concerned about. And this fear that there was going to be, that the government was going to create some kind of standard and then that standard uh, might be used against people. Um, what I understand now from looking at it is the standard is for insurance companies to provide a basic standard of care. So your insurance company is no longer going to be able to say, 
oh, we don't cover medications. Oh, we don't cover well baby clinics. Oh, we don't cover pregnancy. Oh, we don't cover uh, routine checkups. There are the, the, the standards that are going to be set by the government will regulate the entire insurance industry so that no longer will people be uh, left out of co coverage that's necessary. I would agree with that. And I'd also add that 85% um, of, of, of the people in our country are insured, but the crisis has to do not only with the 15% that lack insurance, but the cost for people that are, that are insured. None of the plans will take over the relationship between patient and doctor. Absolutely. The government is not going to hold, is not buying all the hospitals and hiring all the doctors. It will still be a, a mix of uh, what we would call market reforms, um, and it will still be what we have, but it will build from the successes and correct uh, some of the disparities and correct some of the problems. So it's absolutely, that is not true. It is not a government takeover. It, it will expand on what has worked and improve where we need to see improvement, we all. Unfortunately, we have used up actually half of our program already. So we'll be back in one minute, so don't go anywhere. You may want to bring a pen to mark down certain things when we come back, so stay tuned. For over 25 years, KNXT has been serving the people of the San Joaquin Valley with good family television. That's just not available anywhere else. It's important for you, the viewer, to help support this valuable tool of ministry. KNXT needs to continue to grow and bring you important programming about your faith. But sometimes it's hard to stop and find the time. Make it easy. Go to knxt.tv and find out how easy it is to support your Catholic television station, KNXT TV. Hello again and welcome to the second part of our program today on healthcare reform. We're looking at the myths and these are so prevalent uh, we've listed one of them already, that it's going to be a government takeover of everything regarding medicine and hospitals and all procedures. It's going to be a government. It's going to be despotic. It's going to be awful. That's one myth. Uh, we, we dispelled that one. But now we're going to look at six more that uh, are, are maybe variants on that form. So why don't we try this one? Health care reform is going to lead to rationing. Um, Ernie, you, the, you have an angle on this. Well, we're, the system right now has rationing. When you have older Americans splitting their pills because of the donut hole, the benefit gap, that's rationing. Mm -hmm. When you have 50 to 64-year-olds who um, are kicked off of their health care plans because they were sick one time before in their lives, that's rationing, or when they can't even get health insurance. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of disparities in rationing as we go right now. The legislation that we're looking at, in fact, correct, corrects all of those elements, and it is the exact opposite. It, is not, it will not mean rationing. What it will mean is more preventative services, so people have to go to the hospital less, um, more help for people that can't afford to pay for their health care. As I said earlier, closing the donut hole, which is that big, big, huge benefit gap for people on prescription drugs and Medicare, and, gener and also, um, bringing more people into the system so that, so that um, it is more equal in terms of people paying premiums. You know, when you have the doubling of premiums, uh, either paid by employers or individuals in the next five years, which, isn't, which is anticipated, that it, by nature is a form of rationing. So unless we rein in these costs and unless we get um, um, a more uh, people covered, um, it, it's the exact opposite. In fact, what will happen in healthcare reform is, is, is less rationing mm -hmm. and more care for people that need it. Mm -hmm. uh, a third uh, myth we'd like to uh, clarify or dispel, public options create death panels and euthanasia. Well, that, you know, from ARP's perspective, you know, because our members are over the age of 50, uh, that's one of the most offensive allegations in this entire debate. It's not to, the, 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 in fact, the statement is not just about public options. The statement has been, and it's a myth and it's untrue, that these health care plans, the health care reform, will lead to death panels or lead to, um, as you said, euthanasia. That's absolutely just false. There, there's language in the bills that talks about people talking to their doctors about what's called advanced directives. 
And that's all that's there, and it's something that we all have to do. I was, for example, this summer, I had some minor, minor surgery a few months ago. And when I talked to my doctor about it, he asked me about my own advanced directives. That's a conversation that we all need to have with our families and our doctors. So it is absolutely not true. There will not be rationing of care. In fact, there will be better care for people, and there will not be euthanasia or these death panels, which is a total um, untruth. It seems to me that, uh, that one, of these, one of these tactics is using, using people's fear. It's a lot easier to get people to say no to oh, something yeah. that changes if you can play on a fear that they have. Uh, it's not like we're shooting blanks in the dark here. It's not like there isn't any other good example of national health care available to us. There are other countries surrounding us, especially in developed countries, who have perfectly fine health care systems that have regulations and, and, and national aspects to them, if, if not completely national health care. Uh, but, the, but the fear of change and the fear of losing my doctor or the fear of not being able to, to make my own decisions, that makes it easy for people to write off the idea of health care in the first place and, and not even consider how we might address this huge uh, health care issue and crisis in our nation. And for many um, Christians who care about life from conception uh, to the end of life, um, there's been a, a manipulation of, of fear so that people are afraid that there are going to be uh, there's going to be federal funds for abortion, and that is absolutely already a law that the, that the federal government cannot use funds for abortions. And so to stir that up is, I think, uh, inhumane for people who are passionate about this. And then when you start getting different messages and you get confused, you want to leave your, take your hands up and go, just leave it alone. And that is absolutely impossible to do. Now, that was the fourth myth, actually, that um, is going to fund abortions, something that the Catholic Church would be obviously diametrically opposed. And since we are operating and owning 648 hospitals in the country, it's obviously uh, a concern of the Catholic Church that that not be part of a package. And the bishops have gone on record and have made it clear where they will support uh, reform and where they will give direction as to why they cannot support certain things that are turning out to be, as we say, myths. Now the fifth one, and this one may, may need some real clarification from our panel, we're going to end up willy-nilly with socialized medicine. Um, first of all, what is socialized medicine? Is it done by a socialist? And what is it, um, what's the uh, fear that's underneath all of that? Well, first of all, as I said earlier, um, this is not about the government buying all the hospitals and hiring all the doctors. The private, the private system that we've had over the years where people can choose their own doctors, can make decisions about their own health insurance, that has remained and, in fact, it's built on. So it's not about socialized medicine. That is not in any of the legislation that has been proposed um, that's in front of Congress right now. It's absolutely not true. One thing that I'm looking forward to is moving up on that chain of, um, well, that list of the countries, you know, we're the most expensive. We spend the most money on health care, but we're still ranked 36th. Uh, we could do better than that. I mean, if you go to the Olympics and you come in 36th, we don't call that a good Olympics, but how can we as a country be not willing to do what it is that 35 other countries are doing better than us at less expense, which brings up my next great myth. Reforming our health care system, it's just overly costly. It's going to cost us more than it's worth. Can someone address the economics of health care reform? Well, I'm not an economist, but I do understand that 
if I buy an energy saving refrigerator, it's going to cost me a little bit more up front, but the savings are going to happen over the long haul. And that's where we're at right now with health care. We have not uh, done as Jacob uh, told the Pharaoh or Joseph told the Pharaoh to during the fat oh, yeah. years to uh, save for the lean years. We're in lean years, but even with that, health care is so important that we need to invest now so that our costs will be saved later. That is absolutely at the center of it, and it is really a matter of moral will. Um, we spend a lot of money on other things that put us in debt, and it is unconscionable that we do not have as the highest priority health care for all Americans. And, and I would also add in terms of um, whether it's going to break the bank, it, if, we do, if we do nothing, that's what breaks the bank. If we do nothing, you will continue to see more foreclosures, more bankruptcies, more negative impact on, on families. Um, if we do nothing, you'll continue to see people splitting their medications. You'll continue to see, let me give you an example of, of how health care reform helps the, the, fiscal, uh, the fiscal situation. By, covering, by not covering 50 to 64-year-olds, what you have is people entering Medicare with chronic mm. diseases. If, I don't, if, we don't, if people don't get checked dur during that time of their life, they many times wind up with diabetes or things that, uh, unless they've had preventative medicine, bec unless they've had coverage that helps them get preventative med medicine, they wait until they get to Medicare to correct these things. Mm -hmm. If just for that population, 7.1 million people that lack insurance, not because they don't want it, but because they can't afford it or because they're excluded because of pre-existing conditions, if we could remedy that, then that will make it more affordable for Medicare to, to, to sustain itself over the long term. So it's, it's, it's really it's a good question to say, can we afford it? And um, um, the answer is we can't afford to wait because it's 17 percent of our economy. All right, People, um, as I said, on Medicare are spending 30 percent of their income even with Medicare. Mm -hmm. And for working families, um, the premiums are yeah. due to go up in the next couple in, yep. To, to double, as I said, so it's, it's a question of not being able to afford to wait. I think it's kind of uh, uh, interesting that, that, you, that you bring up the, uh, the, the 35 countries if we were in the Olympics. I mean, we go for the gold in the Olympics, but we, we do. don't go for the gold in this. And I, I, forgive me for finding it somewhat amusing that they call that, uh, that, that, that gap the donut hole. Mm. When we think of healthcare, I think we think way too much <laughs> of just going to the doctor. Uh, and we don't think of, of the whole system of health care, including preventative medicine, yeah. including uh, nutritional and, and uh, activity, uh, exercise, uh, health information that should be at the, at the front and center. If we had more preventative medicine, we'd have less of the chronic disease, less of the, uh, perhaps, perhaps less of the diabetes, perhaps less of, of, the, of the chronic conditions that come on later because we haven't taken care of ourselves as well as we could. Statistics are, are not the be all and end all of, uh, of a case, but there's two that I, I really find startling looking at them. It says this, that there's this estimate that it would cost about $699 billion to implement um, health care reform, which sounds to me a bit staggering because I don't even have any money like that but 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 it says it'll save three trillion by the year 2020 which is like saying it's getting back to the light bulb uh, example of you know you you do energy conscious things that maybe there's an outlay at the start because there will be there's startup costs and yet the whole benefit of this believe it or not is playing into the hands of those that are very you know, worried about the economy part. Like, it's interesting to know we're not making a case only on um, Jesus, which is what we made the case last week, which was a good case. Jesus has a lot of light to shed on this, but so does um, the economy, that it's even a good thing and a necessary thing for us as a country to support our own life, never mind our wars, which we don't need money for, but we do have money for them, don't we? Yeah, we like do it. finance them. I don't know how we do, but we somehow scrape it together and can pull off wars. But how we can't pull off an overhaul or a retooling 
or uh, getting the best that you have and then finesse it to make it better yet. Why can't we do this? So my final question to our panel, 20 points, please. How can we and how will we finance this effort of ours at comprehensive health care reform? Ernie. Well, the first thing to do is to, is to reduce the cost in the current system. For example, Medicare Advantage plans, they're paid 14% higher than what's called regular Medicare. And so we need to correct, so, so I know that most of the legislation deals with that disparity in a number of other ways. So, so make it more efficient, do a better job of prevention, do a better job of, of, of eliminating fraud and abuse from our system, for example. Sure. And getting, if the irony of it is if you get more people covered, okay, you lower costs because you have more people contributing mm -hmm. into the system, all right, and um, by the very nature of that, it does lower costs. There are, um, there are employer fees. Um, there's um, a, a new, there's a tax for people who, um, for very uh, upper income individuals in many of the legislation. So there's two combinations of making our system, the current systems more efficient, um, actually using the current resources we have better in a way to where we can get more coverage but yet save costs, improve on preventative care, and some of the legislative proposals that are present in the bills. You're right, it's going to take an early investment, uh, but if you look at um, other programs in the past, there, there were earlier, there were front-end investments that, that um, for Social Security and Medicare and, and Medicaid as well, but eventually what they did was to stabilize uh, the economic challenges and, and more benefit for people that need it. Well, I want to thank our panels that we have had these past two weeks. We've had people that are local. Then we've had people come from San Jose and all the way from Sacramento. We've been very gifted here at KNXT with the way that, Susan, uh, that uh, Carol Bean pulled together a wonderful uh, panel and also a wonderful outline of our four half programs. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ernie, for coming here today. We hope you'll be following this up. And I know we'll be doing another program next week, actually, on immigration reform, which is another burning issue that cannot go away and we must deal with. But I also hope you'll be back on other weeks when we do pick up the th threads that we have woven a little bit today around health care reform. It's something to pray for, but it's something to work at also. Please do not give up. Do something concrete. And let's decide that we will do something as a church and as a believing community to step up to the plate and work for health care reform. God bless.